Welcome to Relentless Truth with John Warren, the podcast that extracts truth from a wide range of topics, revealing who God is, who we are, and how we relate to each other. Now, here's John with this week's powerful and practical insights. Welcome to Relentless Truth. I'm John Warren. It's good to be with you again. Please like, share, review, and subscribe to Relentless Truth. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, or you can go to our website, johnwarrenmedia.com. Please send a comment there on our contact form if you'd like to, or you can send an email directly to me at john at johnwarrenmedia.com. We are grateful for you. you uh, there are more of you who follow this podcast than I frankly anticipated when we set out to do this work almost two full years ago. We are, I think this might be episode 100-ish, we're getting close if not. And last time we talked about the U.S. government, specifically the executive branch, specifically the notion of the president uh, and the way the media labels the economy, the this administration's economy. And I, I know uh, all of you are concerned about the economy of the United States, the, the economic position that we're in, the, the economic future. I've been talking in recent class periods with my students about economic indicators, leading and lagging, uh, that is, those that tell us what might happen in the future and those that tell us what just happened in the past. And unlike a lot of textbook writers, I, I kind of struggle with that notion because I think uh, indicators are, you, you know, can be both. And in fact, uh, leading and lagging. And in, in other words, they capture what has happened in the recent past. And then, and, and they also are predictive of where we're going in the future. This is an odd economy. And I know it can be a little disconcerting, uh, concerning. Uh, it can be uh, daunting to watch inflation make prices go up dramatically. And this, this whole employment scene where, particularly in the hospitality industry, there, companies have a hard time finding enough workers. And yet, if you're looking for a job, for a good job, for the kind of position that you 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 really want and enjoy, that can be also challenging. And so you hear that, well, wait a minute, we only have three and a half percent unemployment. And yet I know people who, who still are trying to find the right employment. And all of that can be concerning and make, our, make us wring our hands. We I go often to the Sermon on the Mount for comfort where Jesus tells us not to be anxious and he talks about caring for the birds of the field and the fact that they don't have storehouses and and then uh, and then he talks about us and, and our our posture toward our children and says something like if you being evil you know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father in heaven give good things to those who ask him. I just probably butchered that quote, but it's right after that ask, seek, and knock section. And and I we get tremendous comfort from that, but, and I say but, or I should say and, uh, we also fret because there's some things going on in, in our government that that concern us. And, you know, I, I, I want to resist the some of the hyperbole of some commentators out there but but I can look at the numbers and I I I know how to you know do basic math and and I I can see that our national debt is out of control I've talked about that before on this podcast and I'm I'm not this isn't some kind of rally cry for, you know, throw them all out necessarily, although that might not be a bad thing. But we've gotten our, ourselves in a position where the, the national debt is, is greater than 
our GDP. And, and one of the problems you'll have, if you'll, if you'll just go to your computer and, or your phone and, and, and look, do, do just a basic Google search on, on that issue, the, the national debt versus GDP, you'll see, I mean, by most accounts, we're at about 120% now. Uh, national debt to to GDP, and there's a thing you can track if you if you care to, you can track the the debt service that the net interest payments of the United States government, and you'll see that that we are nearing, you know, I think we're 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 just over a trillion dollars in annual interest payments on our debt. And you'll also stumble across other analyses that'll that'll look something like this. You'll you'll hear people say, well, we have 32-ish trillion in debt, and but we've got another 50 trillion in in unfunded obligations that add to the debt. So we're we're somewhere between 80 and 100 trillion dollars in total total commitments of the United States government. And and as as that continues to rise then it well, well it, you know everybody who looks at this says that those net interest costs are are going to continue to rise rather sharply. If you look at a curve if you can imagine this from as far back as you want to go to to 2021, we, we were not flat. It was upward sloping, these these net interest costs. But when you look at 2023, we we are we, we are sloping upward and and dramatically. I, I guess if if I believe the numbers that I've seen, the uh, we're actually uh, at I don't know, 600, 700 billion. Um, but by other accounts, we're over a trillion. I don't, I don't know why we can't all agree on that number uh, in, in net interest costs. But, but what everybody does agree on is the slope of the curve for the next 10 years is dramatic. And what that means is, is that spending on, on interest expense will pass other budget categories like income security programs the the all the 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 things we provide to children and and supplemental security income unemployment compensation uh, family support foster care and so on the interest payments will will pass in 2024 the medicaid and a children's health insurance program and by 2028, we'll spend more on interest than we do on national defense. I hope you hear that. We'll spend more on interest expense than national defense. So, and by 2031, we'll spend more on interest than we will on all non-defense discretionary spending. So, so yes, we, we have a problem (laughs) and the, the problem really is is not a simple one because this, this spending and, and, and here, here, let me, let me just give you some more statistics here real, real quickly. The federal reserve system, the, 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 our national bank, which is an independent bank. If you've been with this podcast, listening to this podcast, you've, you know what the you know the function of the Federal Reserve, and I have friends, some friends who you know say we should abolish the Fed and so on, and that that's another conversation for another day. But if you look at the composition of the national debt held by the public, then you see foreign holders and what they hold, and you hear all this. Oh my goodness, China owns more of our debt, and and you know more than half, and all that's not true. China, China owns about, holds about a trillion, a little over a trillion dollars of our debt. But the thing that alarms me, and, and, and the UK owns a chunk of it, and Japan, Japan owns more than China of our debt, by the way. 
about 1.3 trillion. China is just over a trillion. And 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 Ireland owns some, and Luxembourg, and Switzerland, and Belgium, and then a bunch of other countries. But the the issue that concerns me more is uh, we've we've got the in terms of domestic ownership of our debt, we've got mutual funds at three point four trillion, depository institutions at one point seven, state and local governments at one point four trillion, and, and, and these numbers sound small, don't they? But 1.4 trillion is not small. Pension funds, 1.3, and 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 then the Federal Reserve, our national bank owns 6.2 round numbers trillion dollars of our national debt. So when things like, and I know I've talked about this before, and I'm not going there again today, but uh, with any detail, but Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, all those. The handful of banks that struggled or went out of business a few weeks ago. When 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 that kind of thing happens, it it gives us all pause, doesn't it? It, it makes us think. Well, now wait a minute. What if? And and I'm not looking to cause, and I, I'm pretty sure I can't because I'm just not powerful. But um, I'm not looking to cause you a a, a sleepless night or undue concern but this whole system is based on on confidence and and this whole you know you'll hear all this talk about foreign investors own more u.s debt no foreign investors in total own about 33 percent of our debt domestic about 67 but it is this notion it is this agreement that we have it it's it's this it's this perception. It's it's Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market is what it really is. But it, but it's but it's it's this idea that we we have confidence in this system, and it's the confi- It's our confidence in the system that makes it strong. In other words, if we really looked at the numbers, and and I I think there's going to be a day of reckoning uh, at some point. But if we really looked at the numbers and we said, you know what? Our, our debt is 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 outpacing GDP now. And, and I know modern monetary policy doesn't care about that. Modern monetary policy says, or progressive monetary policy, let's, let's call it that, says that, no, government spending is actually good spending if it if it's on infrastructure and does things to stimulate the economy. And 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 government government spending is accounts for depending on who you talk to which where you get the data about a third maybe even a little more of our gdp and so there are those who believe that government spending is accretive is good for adds to the economy which is crazy because here here's where this really gets ugly the market sets interest rates. I know the press would have you think the Federal Reserve sets interest rate interest rates. The Federal Reserve sets one interest rate. That is the overnight borrowing rate. We call it the discount rate. It's now five or five and a quarter percent, somewhere in that range. And and the reason there's a range is larger banks borrow at a slightly overnight at a slightly lower number, lower interest rate than smaller banks do. So so we're in that five to five and a quarter, maybe as much as five and a half percent range for the discount rate. That is the only rate that the Federal Reserve sets. All other rates are set by the market. And you say, hold on a second. Don't, doesn't the U.S. Treasury sell T-bills, T-notes, and T-bonds and, and some, some of these other, other instruments? Yes, they do. But they have to sell them at market rates. And so I want you to think about something. The yield curve is is inverted right now. That means that long-term rates are lower than short-term rates. That that shouldn't be the case. That's never the case for any protracted period of time. So if the yield curve, think think about this for a second. If the yield curve just does what yield curves do and it and it de-inverts so that it's upward sloping. And all I mean when I say that is that the 10-year treasury is higher than the overnight discount rate. 
the passage of time contains more risk and 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 i'm grossly oversimplifying here but but that that is the reason uh, that long-term rates are generally higher than short-term rates if you invest your money in something over 10 years 20 years 30 years even five two or five years two to five years you're you're taking more risk than than you do if you invest it overnight so the yield curve typically slopes upward if you're looking from left to right if time is on the horizontal axis and interest rates on the vertical axis so so if the yield curve corrects the cost of financing the debt for the united states government goes up the treasury issues the debt and now I'm telling you that the Federal Reserve, our national bank, which is not the Treasury, which is an independent-ish bank, they own over $6 trillion of this debt. They own 39% of the amount of the debt that is owned by domestic creditors. They own 40% let's call it 40% of domestically held debt. So I want you to think about this. They regulate the banks. The Federal Reserve does. Now, if you're if if you're a banker, you know this, but I don't think the public realizes it, but let's just say you're in Florida where I am and you have a state chartered bank. And you, so the FDIC regulates you because they insure your deposits. And they look at all safety and soundness measures. There's a camel's rating. You can, you can look this up on their website or go to the Federal Reserve and look it up. Or uh, Comptroller of the Currency, uh, U.S. Treasury Department. You can see all this. But, but they give banks ratings. They do examinations, safety and, sound exam, uh, s- safety and soundness examinations. And, and, and so you're regulated by the FDIC if you're a state chartered bank. If you, if you have a holding company, you're also regulated by the Federal Reserve, this bank that owns six, over $6 trillion of the United States government's debt. And thirdly, you're regulated by the state OFR, the Office of Financial Regulation. So you have three sets of, of, of regulators who examine the bank for, among other things, safety and soundness. They use some ratios. They study asset quality. It, it sounds complicated. It's really not. It, it's really the adequacy of reserves and strength of management and liquidity and all, all of those things. And there are some standards, some tried and true standards that that really do matter. Well, you know, if you've been listening to Relentless Truth for any period of time, you know that Banks are able to lend uh, a large percentage of their deposits. They'll, they'll have what is known as a loan to deposit ratio. And you know that if all the depositors show up at the bank, we've talked about this before, even recently, that banks have a, would have a liquidity problem. And that's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. But, but think about this just, just for a moment. And this is, this is a rather dark thought, but I, but I think it's prudent to, to kind of think about it. Uh, if just, just imagine for a moment that the yield curve de-inverts. And so long-term rates become higher than short-term rates. And let's say, you know, there'll be some period where the Fed can't adjust and reduce you know they've always thought that they had this role they play where they are to stimulate the economy and accomplish certain gdp growth but there's some period where they won't react and and let's just say mortgage rates 30-year mortgage rates are over you know we're almost there today but say we're over seven percent and they and they kind of stay there maybe they can go to eight and 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 short-term rates the fed levels off at at five and a half then the, the market will set the rates on all the, all the treasury securities that are used to fund the debt and, and ranging from one year to many years. And, 
and, and just just imagine for a second that the cost of servicing the United States government debt moves upward even more exponentially than what I just described. And say we go to two trillion dollars in the next few years in interest. I mean, that's not a far fetched scenario. And imagine where we have an environment where the consumers begin to lose a little bit of confidence. I'm not advocating for this, but, and I don't think we should necessarily today, but consumers start to lose confidence in their bank's financial strength. Banks, plural, financial strength. And and I, I just can see this storm brewing where if consumers lose, lose confidence, the government doesn't do anything to address our deficits. We're adding to this debt at alarming rates. We've somehow gotten oblivious to it, jaded to it, hard-hearted about it. It doesn't trouble us like it should. We continue to add to the debt. I could see a scenario where, where we, we become, as a country, technically insolvent. The day we really have a major problem is the day that the full faith and credit of the United States government doesn't mean what it means today. What it means today is you're going to get your money back. And I think we're a long way from that, that, that issue, the full faith and credit of the United States becoming less meaningful. I think it still means something. It means more than it means at other countries, with other countries. But, but, but I, I think there's this, there's this series of events. I'm going to call it cascading, which kind of is scary to think about. And, 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 and it's, it, if you go read, oh, I don't know, U.S. Government Accountability Office, read, read their, go to their website. It's gao.gov. And, and, and look at the, the nation's, it, it, they call it the nation's unsustainable fiscal path. And, 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 it's, and, they, and they track the debt held by the, the public. And, and, and just look at it. Think about these things that we're talking about here. Think about, I'm not talking about consumer confidence that allows people the comfort in going out and buying things. That's, that's, that's one thing. But I'm talking about confidence in our financial system it is held together its strength is predicated on confidence the strength as we lose confidence the indices begin to reflect the fact that we shouldn't have confidence therefore making the confidence spiral or cascading continue and and i know i've talked about what you can do and how to ensure your you know, your monies are insured by the FDI, FDIC. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. So I, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about a calamitous environment where there, there aren't a lot of good answers. And by the way, for those of you who say, well, you're just not modern. What the government would do would be to stimulate by printing more money. Nope. Can't do it. The reason they can't do it is because of out of control debt and debt service. And the day the United States government can't service its debt is, is the day that our credit gets downgraded. And eventually, you, you wouldn't have, you, 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 relative to other countries, you wouldn't be as strong. And full faith and credit in the United States government wouldn't mean as much as it means in other countries. And we get replaced as the world leader economically and from a currency standpoint. I think we're a long way from that, but we're only a long way from that is if we take corrective action. We, you know, if you run a business or even if you, if you have a household and, and you, you care about your financial condition, one of the things you try to do is not make your business or your family's financial condition predicated on some external factor that you don't control. Now, now we're all in that position, aren't we? Where, where we've got to have faith and trust in God. Yes, we're not self-sufficient, self-sustaining. I get that. I believe that. I know that's a biblical truth. But we do try to manage such that we're not taking on undue market risk. 
undue external environmental risk. Well, the United States government needs to do that. And to do that, what we're going to have to do is pass, and for crying out loud, why in the world doesn't somebody campaign on this? And, and I, I know the answer. That's a rhetorical question. But we've got to pass a balanced budget amendment, period. This is how, if you ask me, okay, well, that was a lot of doomsday rambling, John. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Well, you pass a balanced budget amendment. That has an immediate positive impact on markets. Now, I, 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 I'm, I understand that it might not be so positive in some markets, some days, some as reflected by some indices. I get that. Stock market might not like it for a little bit. It, it should like it, but, but, but this, this, is, this means that government spending can't just con, uh, go on spiraling out of control. So, so balanced budget amendment would be number one. That would be stimulative to the economy. And then, like I said last week, uh, in last week's episode, a, a corporate tax cut, not, not for the fat cats, not for rich people. You can close some loopholes for rich people. That's fine. You're not going to cut your way to prosperity there, but, but okay. And th- those things would be, Art Laffer figured it out those uh, years ago. Those things, look him up, by the way. Art, Arthur is his first name, Laffer, L-A-F-F-E-R, and look at the Laffer curve. There's there's a there's a place in there where where you could you could then stimulate the economy, improving government revenue, and we could actually decrease the debt. We did this. I know this is shocking to some. We did this during Bill Clinton's presidency. At, at that recently it wasn't that long ago. So, look, this balanced budget amendment would send the right signal. It, it, there's going to be pain somewhere if we do that. Entitlements have to be reconfigured, have to be addressed. That's not politically popular, but I wish it were because I wish we had the courage in this country. I wish our leaders, our politicians had the courage to say, you know what? I, I, I've got to ignore these opinion polls because I've got to do the right thing. They sent me here to Washington to do something for this country and I've got a brain and I know this is a problem. This is a problem. You're not going to recognize it. We're not going to recognize it as a nation until it becomes a serious problem that has to be addressed. Look at how irresponsible Congress is with even the budget, even spending bills, even look, look at how they treat the, the debt ceiling. They wait to the last minute. They, they kick the can down the road. They extend, extend, extend instead of systematically approving a budget every year that is balanced. You know why that is? They don't want to go on record doing the right thing because the American people don't insist that they do the right thing. And, and I think in many cases, the American people don't know what the right thing is. Well, I can tell you this, the right thing is fiscal prudence. The right thing is balancing the budget. In your home, in your business, this is how you live. I'm not suggesting the United States government isn't complex. It's very complex. Numbers of constituents, numbers of moving parts. You know, your business isn't responsible for our national defense. I get that. That, That's a, that's quite a burden. Your, your business doesn't have a CIA. It doesn't have an IRS. It doesn't have social programs. Most of your businesses don't. It doesn't, think it needs to provide education. Government has got to be radically rethought. Not, not, not the core principles, not, not the constitution, but, but the way we spend money has got to be radically addressed. And, and if we do that, we're going to have to radically address the role of government. And you can't just, you know, reach down, grab the emergency brake and pull it up with all the force you can you can pull it up with that 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 causes bad things to happen we've got to methodically tap the brakes we can do this we have to elect leaders who care and get it and have courage i i don't know who the right person is nationally to do this but we need a tone setter in washington i'll tell you this it's not donald trump and it's not joe biden And I'm not sure it's anybody else whose names we know right now. It might be Ron DeSantis. He might get it. I'm not sure yet. 
he, he hasn't been bad as a state governor, but we need somebody who's going to run on fiscal responsibility. And, and look, you could shut down the U.S. defense and the U.S. military and not solve this problem. So, so don't, you, you, don't, you don't have to be a weak country from a defense standpoint to fix this. You, you, you have to have resolve. You have to have spending discipline. And it matters. I didn't spend a lot of time today talking about what the cascading would look like because I don't want to, I don't, I want to, I want to scare us into reality. I want us to be honest, to be candid about what this could look like. But I, I, all these eventualities, I I don't know. I mean, back in the early 20th century, back in the early 1900s that that we, we survived World War II and the Spanish flu and the roaring twenties happened. And it just feels like we're right back there. And, and I, I, I don't want us to go plunging headlong over a cliff like we did with the Great Depression. And I, and I even wonder, did our government during COVID already obligate us toward that eventuality with the stimulus? I, I, I'm, I, if you look at the impact, and that, that's a, it's, kind of, it's kind of cool for, for uh, philosophical purposes because we had a Republican president and then, then a Democrat was elected. And so we've got both parties doing this to us spending way more than we should have printing money plunging us into this inflationary environment and now now the very the very villain who caused it government is is going to uh, is going to ride in on the horse and solve it and 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 everybody's going to try to take credit for that so there's a challenge that I hope we have the resolve I hope we have the resolve to do the right thing I welcome your comments Please don't hesitate to send along an email to john at johnwarrenmedia.com or go to my website, johnwarrenmedia.com. Send along a comment on the contact form. I hope you'll like, share, subscribe to, and review our podcast. The organic growth has been incredible. I'm grateful for all of our partners, for Blueberry, for his production, and others who have uh, done lots of good technical work to make this podcast happen. So I look forward to being with you next time. Next week, we're going to talk about something that is interesting. It is the graduation season, and we're going to talk about personal responsibility and this this eventuality that everyone has to come to. The, eventually, everyone has to come to this point where we we address our actions. We address who we're going to be couple of stories from scripture that I think you'll enjoy. And, and, and really what we have to come to is, is, is this, this notion of, of repentance, this, uh, and we'll explain what that is next week. So I look forward to being with you again next time. Thanks for listening to Relentless Truth with John Warren. Please consider sharing this podcast and subscribe to receive future episodes. Connect with John regarding your comments, questions, and show ideas through johnwarrenmedia.com or at John Warren Media on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. That's all for this episode. Join us next week for another edition of Relentless Truth with John Warren. Thank you.